Okay. Uh, last day we ended with this problem here where we had two identical Volvos, but one was moving at 60 miles an hour, 30 meter per second, the other one was parked. And they had a collision, and we were told that during the collision, the bumpers locked and they became one ugly, ugly Volvo with eight wheels. And the question was, uh, how fast are they going? And we worked this on the board, and we found that since the mass of the moving material doubled, in order to conserve momentum, it had to be going half as fast. Now folks, by after the collision, I mean right after the collision. You can't wait for these two to scrape across the pavement, end up in someone's tulips. Uh, right after the collision, they are going at 15 meters per second. They cannot stop. They cannot be stopped right after the collision. If they did, they would violate law. What law? Newton's third law. And you can't violate Newton's third law without havoc with Armageddon, cats and dogs living together. It's terrible. Okay. So the kinetic energy is not zero after the collision. And yet when we when we decided which kind, which flavor of collision this was, uh, we decided it was maximally inelastic. And that surprised some of you. That's because you weren't listening when I defined maximally inelastic. Maximally inelastic is when the bumpers lock. Period. That's it. If they're moving together, if they're moving as one unit after the collision, it's maximally inelastic. It doesn't mean all the energy is lost, mechanical energy. It just loses the most energy allowed by law. Again, third law. Third law. Okay. Now, let's look at this problem one that was due today. You have a boxcar traveling at 10 meters per second approaching a string of identical boxcars, four of them, sitting stationary. The moving boxcar collides and links with the stationary cars. What, what flavor of collision is this, people? Shout it out. Maximally inelastic, yes. That's all you gotta know is they link, they become one. What is the final speed of the five cars? Now, this was on an exam. It was the first problem on the exam in 1998. I know it was that year because that's the year that I team taught with Jeff Adams. And I remember uh, saying to Jeff, I said, Jeff, um, we're going to have a lot of questions from our students wanting to know what the mass of the car did, of the uh, box car. We didn't have that 18,537 there. I suggested that we put a, a hint that says, you don't need to know the mass of the box car, you just need to know they're all the same. Jeff got an evil smile on his face and he said, I got a better idea. Let's give it to him. And he pulled that number right out of his left ear. I watched him. It came right out of his left ear. Okay. And the crazy thing, the thing that was really kind of disappointing, is that that night on the exam, most of the class used that number. They were just punching in that number over and over again, over and over again, wasting time. Let's do it together. This is a collision. All collisions are momentum, and all collisions conserve momentum. As long as I include everything that's colliding in my system, the impulse will be zero, and that general equation up there becomes this equation of momentum conservation. If the initial means right before the collision, the final means right after the collision. This is a vector equation, so I need a coordinate system. Now this equal sign is the collision. Everything to the left of it is before the collision, and I have one boxcar of mass M moving at 10 meters per second. I also have four boxcars of mass M moving not at all. And you can see that I just wasted ink. 
Then the collision happens. After the collision, I have five boxcars of mass M, all moving at some final velocity. I wish I knew what that was. But at this point, it's just math. I've got uh, M times 10 is equal to 5M V final. The M cancels. It could have been 18,537. It could have been 26,412. It don't matter, as long as it's the same for each box number. That means V final is going to be 10 over 5, or 2 meters per second. And in this coordinate system, the positive 2 means to the right. OK? Now, <clears throat> this is what it looks like visually. You've got that boxcar coming in. Oh, yeah, the mass happens to be 18,537. And then it locks. OK? Now, folks, all collision problems are pretty much that easy. OK? All pretty much that easy. Now, we decided last day that we wanted to use momentum with collisions because the type of energy that we have equations for, we call that mechanical energy, kinetic plus potential, that kind of energy is very rarely conserved during a collision. Once in a blue moon it happens, but we never know in advance when that blue moon is upon us. And so if you ever start from the assumption that energy is going to be conserved, you're going to be disappointed. Now, here's the thing. The Verk energy equation is still true. Energy actually is conserved. Just not the types of energy that we have a handle on. Not the kinds of energy that we've got formula for. Most of the energy is going into twisting up this oval, the energy of deformation. And it's not just our class that doesn't have an equation for that, no one. No one has an equation for that. Supercomputers can't handle that. Okay? So even though the Verk energy equation is true, it's not helpful. It's useless. And so that's why I tell you, never ever try to solve a collision problem with energy. Now, again, those of you that are trying to make this decision, do I use energy, do I use momentum, it's a pretty easy decision tree. You always ask yourself, is this a collision? If yes, momentum. And indeed, you can go to that version of the equation right there, because there's no impulse. Second question you ask yourself, does this problem involve time? Am I looking for time? Am I given time to use? If yes, it's momentum. You never learn anything about time using energy. But now, you're going to have to use the general version of the equation, this one over here. If it's not one of those two cases, it's probably energy. Okay? And so that's just the way you make your decision before each question. Now, likewise, <coughs> This Tarzan swing problem, if I wanted to know how fast Tarzan was going, that's an energy problem. That just screams out energy. Because the Verk is zero, and so uh, the potential energy, gravitational energy, is all transformed into kinetic energy. Bada bing, bada boom, I'm done. Well, does that mean that the momentum equation impulse momentum equation is not valid? No. You could still use that if you're really, really good at vector calculus. Because the vert done by the string or the vine is zero. Because vert is defined as uh, zero when the force is perpendicular to the motion. But the impulse, that's that force times time, that's a vector. And that force times the time changes direction as the line changes direction. So the impulse changes direction and it changes magnitude. If you want to use 
that equation on the right up there, the impulse momentum equation, you better be darn good at vector calculus. I, I wouldn't want to solve it that way. But you use energy, it's trivial. It's trivial. Okay. <clears throat> now, I want to warn you that some collisions don't look like collisions. I told you that all collisions are momentum problems, and in all collisions, momentum is conserved even if C4 is involved. C4 is an explosive. Well, here's an explosion that is a collision, okay? We've got an astronaut in deep outer space. He pushes a button. The propulsion unit strapped on his back ejects some gas with a velocity of 32 meters per second to the right. The astronaut recoils with a velocity of 0.3 meters per second to the left. After the gas is ejected, the mass of the astronaut is 160 kilograms. What's the mass of the ejected gas? So here's what that looks like. He's just floating in deep outer space. Just da 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 I got to get home. So he points himself in the right direction, pushes the button, and there's a wally sort of a thing. Okay? Now, what do you think? Conservation? Conservation of energy or conservation of momentum? momentum? Yeah, momentum. Let's look at energy. I mean, if he's far away from any planets, that's a kind of a big stretch, but if he's far away from any planets, there's no gravitational energy, there's no springs. When he's just sitting there, there's no kinetic energy, and then suddenly he's got kinetic energy, the gas has kinetic energy. Does this leftward kinetic energy cancel the rightward kinetic energy? No or heck no? Heck no, it's just energy. Kinetic energy is always positive. He's got some, the gas has got some, there's some. There was none. The type of energy we've got formulas for is not conserved in this problem. Okay? That varic energy equation is not going to help us. What's happening here is chemical potential energy that we don't have a formula for is being transformed into kinetic energy, but we can't deal with it that way. But we can look at momentum. Initially, he has no momentum, he's not moving. After the button is pushed, he's got momentum to the left, the gas has momentum to the right. If momentum's conserved, I can set the initial momentum equal to the final, and that's what it looks like. Now it's math. I solve for M and I get 1.5 kilograms. Okay? I told you we were going to do rocket science, didn't I? <laughs> rocket science. Okay. Now I've got a little market survey. Momentum is conserved during a collision. What does this mean? A, total momentum for the system adds up to zero before and after the collision, or B, total momentum for the system stays the same before and after the collision. With your clicker, would you please tell me what you think that means? Or these people are confused and this person's, well, already with us. <laughs> okay. Now, the reason those people are confused is that we've had a lot of examples where momentum happened by coincidence or design to be zero before and after. But that's not what it means to conserve something. To conserve something is whatever you got, you keep gotten it. Okay? to be grammatically correct. Now, on that exam, there's going to be uh, at least in two places, probably three places, a basic collision problem. And they look like this. You got uh, a couple blocks, they hit each other, and uh, you got to figure out how fast one of the blocks is moving afterwards. Now, this is one version of this problem I could also give you both velocities after the collision 
and leave out one of the initial, that's just another way to dance this problem. You should be able to solve this basic collision problem very, very quickly. This should be almost uh, trivial to you. With your neighbor, make it so. Okay? Do it. Do it. How many of you are sitting next to someone who's got an answer already? Okay. Starting to get there. Let's do it together. This is a collision, so momentum is conserved. Momentum is a vector, so I need a coordinate system. I'm going to call to the right the positive x direction, to the left negative x. The equal sign is the collision. Everything to the left of the equal sign is the top picture. To the right of the equal sign is the bottom picture. So before the collision, I have three kilograms moving at five meters per second, it's moving to the right, so that's positive momentum. I also have 12 kilograms moving at four meters per second, and it's moving to the left, so that's negative momentum. Then the collision happens. After the collision, I have three kilograms moving at three meters per second, and it's moving to the left, so that's negative. After the collision, I don't know whether that blue block is going to the right or to the left. And so what I do is I assume a positive variable, V final. And I say that the momentum of the blue block is 12 kilograms times V final, and I assume it's to the right. <coughs> now if I solve for V final and I get a negative answer, I'll just know that I assumed wrong, and that it's actually going to the left, okay? Now this is going to be 15 franci minus 48 franci is equal to negative 9 franci plus 12 kilograms V final. This is negative 33 franci is equal to negative 9 franci plus 12 kilograms V final. I add a 9 to both sides, I get negative 24 franci is equal to 12 kilograms V final. That gives me a V final of minus 24 over 12, or minus 2 meters per second. If you have a coordinate system on your page, you will get full credit for this answer. This would be the magnitude And this minus sign would be the direction of your final velocity. However, you will always get full credit if you say the final is equal to 2 meters per second to the left. That would be the magnitude, and that would be the direction. If you write your answer that way, you don't have to have a coordinate system on your page. That's just, that's right. Okay? 
Whoops, left. Okay, so the answer is two meters per second to the left. Now here's the point I want to make. The momentum of the red block is not conserved. It went from 15 to the right to 9 to the left. That's not the same. The momentum of the blue block is not conserved. It goes from 48 to the left to 24 to the left. That's not the same. It's only the momentum of the system. When I add up the momentum for both blocks that I get minus 33 before and after. Okay, that's what it means when the system momentum is conserved. Now, there's another way I can dance this problem. I can say, well, what if they stick together and, and move as one ugly unit with a mass of 15 kilograms? How fast would they be going? Well, if I go back to this, this derivation we have here. Everything on the left hand side of the equal sign is still the same. I still have the same initial uh, velocities, okay? But now, after the collision, they're moving together. And so I can solve for V final. It's going to be negative 33 franci over 15 kilogram, and that's going to be negative 2.2 meter per second, or 2.2 meter per second left. Okay. Now again, you should be able to do that very quickly. Please check that your neighbor has that skill. Do a buddy check. Do a buddy check. that's up against the spring, and you find that as the spring uh, releases, it sends this block along the frictionless part of the track, uh, and it's going six meters per second after it leaves the spring. Um, we want to find in part A here, the spring constant for the spring. Now if you look at those equations on the right for momentum and impulse, do you think we're going to find a value of K there? Yeah, that's just not the way to go. This is an energy problem. And that means we start with energy initial. I'm going to need some room over there, so I'm going to put it over here. Energy initial plus spherical external is equal to energy final. Now I'm going to call this my initial state. I'm going to call this my final state. Since there's no friction on this part of the track, there would be no verk done between the initial and final. At the initial event, I asked the same three questions I always ask. Is anything with mass moving? No. Anything up off the floor? No. Any spring stretched or compressed? Yes. 
And then I go to the, the final event, I ask the same questions. Anything with mass moving? Yes. Anything up off the floor? No. Any spring stretch or compressed? No. That's my equation. I got one half K times one half meter squared is equal to one half times two kilograms times six meter per second. Remember to square that. The person to your right is not going to do that on the exam. They're going to forget. Okay. That's how prevalent that is. Half of you forget. Okay. Now, that gives me a value of K of 288 newtons for each meter. Now, in part B of this problem, um, we have a collision. The small block uh, comes in and collides with the large block, sending it off at 4 meter per second. <coughs> And it travels, after the collision, along a rough section of track, which has a mu sub k of 0.25. Now the first part of the question is just, uh, what, kind of, what kind of final velocity after the collision do I have for this little block? Is it to the right or is it to the left? Now, that's a collision, so I use momentum. And uh, it's a vector, so I need a coordinate system. So before the collision, I have two kilograms moving six meters per second to the right. I had four kilograms, oh, I wasted ink. Afterwards, I've got the two kilograms I don't know whether it's moving left or right or how fast, so I make that a positive variable. And I've got the four kilograms moving at four meters per second, and it's to the right. So that's 12 France I plus zero is equal to two kilogram V final plus 16 France I. I solve for V final by subtracting 16 France I, and I get minus four franci is equal to two kilogram V final, or V final is equal to minus two meter per second, or two meter per second left. Now, the next part of this problem is asking, what type of, of collision is this? Elastic, inelastic, or maximally inelastic? Well, we know, not that collision, that's maximally inelastic. We know that this collision can't be maximally inelastic because the big block is going four meter per second that way and the little block is going two meter per second to the left. They're not traveling together. But how do we know if it's elastic or inelastic? Well, some people just like to look at it and say, you know, that looks inelastic. Or you know, Block, uh, the little block's not moving as fast as it was before. That's probably inelastic. Here's the thing. There's nothing you can look at and tell. You can't sniff the air and know whether that's elastic or inelastic. You have to do a calculation. You have to find the initial kinetic energy before the collision. That's going to be one half times the two kilograms it was moving at six meters per second squared plus one half times the four kilograms that wasn't moving. Remember to square it. <laughs> okay, that's going to be 36 joules plus zero. Afterwards, I have one half times two kilograms. It's going negative two meter per second. The minus sign doesn't matter because I'm squaring it. Plus one half times four kilograms times four meters per second squared. This is going to be four joules plus 32 joules is equal to 36 joules. This is a once in a blue moon experience. The kinetic energy is conserved. You didn't know that when you started the problem. So you best have used 
momentum. Okay, it just it's just a, a a happy day that it happened to conserve energy as well. Now the last part of this problem says, for how many seconds does this big block scrape across the rough section of track? Well, since we're asked for how many seconds, it's momentum. And since it's no longer a collision, the collision's already happened. And now we've just got that block scraping across the table, or the floor. In that case, I have to use the general equation here, and that's going to be P initial uh, plus my force delta T is equal to P final. I need a coordinate system. My initial momentum before it starts scraping is going to be 4 kilograms times 4 meters per second, and it's to the right, so it's positive. The force that is going to change that momentum down to zero is the friction force, kinetic friction by the uh, floor on the block, times the time. Now, if I knew what that friction force was, I'd be done with this problem. Well, I've known how to find forces. You draw a free body diagram. You have a weight force on that block, which is 40 newtons. You have a normal force on that block, which is 40 newtons. There's no acceleration up or down. You have a kinetic friction, and that kinetic friction is going to be mu sub k times the normal force. That's going to be 0.25 times 40. And that's 10. So if I come in here and I say I've got plus 16 Franci, minus 10 Newtons, delta T is equal to zero, delta T is equal to 1.6 seconds. See if your neighbor got that right when they did their homework. If not, you know what to do. Okay. Are there questions on that problem? That's the type of problem that you're going to have on the midterm. Part of it will be energy, part of it will be a collision, part of it will be momentum, a general momentum problem. Okay, so you should be ready for that. Now I want to warn you, and I'm just going to take a few moments to do that, I want to warn you that there will be times as you go through life when it appears that, that I lied to you. Yeah. Remember I told you that momentum is always conserved in every, every, every collision. Well, if I take this clay and throw it down, it appears that I'm lying, okay? If I, uh, if I throw that down, it stops. Now, suppose I were tall enough that I could just drop this from five meters. I'm not that tall. I'm only four meters tall, okay? Now, if I dropped it from five meters, I could figure out how fast it's going before it hits the ground just by conserving energy, okay? I got 50 joules of gravitational energy if that's a one kilogram ball of clay. And so if I solve for uh, speed, I get 10 meter per second. So that ball would be going 10 meter per second right before it collides with the floor, and then it stops. Now, if I look at energy and say, hey, that's not the same energy that I started with. I started with 50 joules and now I got nothing. How do I rationalize that? Where did that energy go? Yeah, deforming the ball of clay. If I look at that ball of clay, it's now flat on one side. If I had a really sensitive thermometer, it would be a little warmer. Uh, I heard a thunk, okay? 
that energy, that 50 joules, went into some buckets that we don't have formulas for. Okay? We just don't have formulas for energy of deformation and the thermal energy and the funk. But when you're talking about momentum, there's only one bucket. MV. You can't sweep anything under the carpet there. So let's talk about momentum. Let's talk about momentum. It's a vector, so I need a coordinate system. Let's call down positive. Right there, it's got a positive 10 franci. Right there, it's got a, a zero value for momentum. Now, if I believe that momentum before the collision equals momentum after the collision, then I have to believe that 10 is equal to zero. But if you'll believe that, you'll believe Fox News. <laughs> That's silliness. You know it's not a news channel, right? It's entertainment for old people. Okay? Angry old people. Don't watch it. Okay, so where's the lie? Or is there a lie? I made you a promise that momentum would always be conserved in a collision, but it was a conditional promise. There was a part that you had to do first. What was that part? Define the system. You had to define the system how? What had to be in the system? Everything that collides or hits or pushes, in this case, it's going to be the earth. It hit the floor, the floor is part of the building, the building's connected to the earth. I've got to include the earth. So let's do that. If I include the earth in my system, then I have to take the momentum of the ball, that's my 10, franchise down, that's the momentum of the Earth in the Earth's frame of reference, zero, before the collision. But after the collision, they're moving together. It's a, a maximally elastic collision. They stick. And I want to find out how fast the Earth is moving after that ball of clay hits it. Well, I plug in my values. I've got, uh, there's my 10 franci. There's the mass of the Earth. Notice I didn't bother to add the one kilogram, that's a little thing. I solve for V final and I get 2 times 10 to the minus 24 meters per second. Can you feel that? No, that's just so tiny that it's just, it's, forget about it. It's negligible, okay? Now what about the energy that we just gave the Earth? The kinetic energy by speeding the Earth up. Well, that's one half mv squared, and the m's kind of big. But the v's kind of small, and it's squared. And so when I do the math, I get 1.2 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules. That's just so close to zero, you can't tell it apart. Now, it started with 50 joules, and this is how much went into speeding up the earth. The rest of it went into making that ball a different shape, okay? So nearly all of that energy went into deformation. So when it looks like Greg lied to you, back up and do your part and redefine your system, okay? Now, let me help you with your tutorial homework that's due tomorrow. Now, there is no tutorial this week, there is no tutorial next week. It's like a two week vacation but you do have homework due tomorrow. And the last two pages of that tutorial is giving uh, some of you brief. And that's because it talks about Galilean transformation. And we never talk about Galilean transformations in this class. But they're not hard. Here's what we mean. Suppose that a red Volkswagen is going to the right at 30 miles an hour and there's a blue truck, pickup truck, parked on the side of the road. Greg, standing on the sidewalk, sees just that. However, Jeff, riding a yellow dump truck, a yellow Tonka dump truck, 
at 30 miles an hour to the right, he sees something different. Well, first of all, in his frame of reference, what does it look like that parked truck is doing? Yeah, it's moving to the left 30 miles an hour. What about the red Volkswagen? Well, Jeff looks out the window and there's that red Volkswagen. He looks out the window a little later, there's that red Volkswagen. He's just always seeing that red Volkswagen right out the window. So in his frame of reference, what does it look like the red Volkswagen's doing? Stopped. And so this is what Jeff sees. And that's what we call a Galilean transformation. That wasn't so hard. That wasn't so hard. Now here's the point though. Greg and Jeff do not agree on what the total momentum of the system is. Greg says, oh, I got a red Volkswagen going 30 miles an hour to the right, and there's nothing, no momentum here for the truck. Jeff says, oh no, you're wrong. I got a great big blue truck moving 30 meters per second to the left, and the Volkswagen doesn't have any momentum. They don't agree on what the momentum is. They don't even agree what direction it is. I think it's to the right, he thinks it's to the left. However, if the Volkswagen collides with the, uh, the truck, Jeff and Greg will agree on one thing, that the momentum is conserved. Greg will say, after the collision, it's still to the right and this big. Jeff will say, after the collision, it's still to the left and this big. They won't agree what that momentum is, but they will agree that it stays the same. And that's what you're doing on the last two pages of that tutorial homework. Now, on the tutorial homework, they don't use 30 miles an hour. They use numbers like 0.6 meters per second. And we got Greg standing on the sidewalk, and that's what Greg sees. Now, in this case, uh, we have Jeff riding the truck to the left at 0.2 meters per second. Now, if those de decimal points are getting in your way, just get rid of them. Let's make that 60 miles an hour, let's make that 20 miles an hour. If you're going down the road 20 miles an hour, and there's a car coming 60 miles an hour towards you, in your frame of reference, where you're stopped, how fast is that red car going? 80 miles an hour. 80 miles an hour. Okay, what about this parked truck? If you're going 20 miles an hour down the road, what does it look like the truck's doing? 20 the other way. Now, if we go back to the decimal places, what Jeff sees is 0.8 for the red and 0.2 for the blue. And that's just a Galilean transformation. Now let me give you a little bit of a warning, a little heads up. Lillian McDermott has a trap in that homework where she asks you, she tells you that the mass of this glider is five times the mass of that glider. What am I going to do with that? Does it matter how big the, the dump truck is that Jeff's riding? Could it, could it have been a bicycle? Yeah, all that's important is how fast he's going. It doesn't matter what he's on. And so you just have to be strong enough to say, that doesn't matter, nice try, Lillian. You didn't, you didn't trick me. Now, clearly, you are getting ready to leave, and I should stop. Okay, let's uh, pick this up on Wednesday. <laughs> Bye. You know, studying physics is hard enough, but doing it from home on your own because of this COVID thing makes it far more challenging. So to help you through this, the physics department has created a virtual help center. We have grad students, TAs, student assistants, and instructors standing by from 8 in the morning until 6 in the evening, Monday through Friday. To sign up for the Virtual Help Center, you will need to download Microsoft Teams, which is free to MSU students. The link to do this is listed on the D2L post under the announcements, and so you will register for Teams using your net ID at msu.montana.edu as your username. 
Then you enter a code provided on your D2L announcement that is specific to your class. If you've already registered uh, to be part of Teams for your tutorial, you can enter the class code to use the Virtual Help Center. When you visit the Virtual Help Center, you enter the general room, type something in the thread like, hey, can I get some help? And a staff person will respond, perhaps by text, but if it's more complicated, and let's face it, physics is complicated, we can initiate a video call. Our staff can use a number of different tools like a whiteboard and a webcam to help you out. So please, we may have to do this social distancing, but our staff is here and is virtually available for you Monday through Friday from 8 in the morning till 6 in the evening. And we want to try to make this experience less, well, less bad. So if you have any questions, you can call or text me, Tom Woods, your Student Success Coordinator, at 406-850-4461. That's all, folks.